Um, my name is Helen He. I'm a nurse training, and welcome today to the OpenMP training series, the last four seven months, um, monthly sessions. So first of all, quick saying of what OpenMP is, is the de facto standard for writing parallel applications for shared memory computers supported by multiple scientific compilers on CPU and GPU architectures. And MPI and OpenMP for CPUs and MPI plus say OpenMP device offload for GPUs are the recommended portable programming models for Prometer, Frontier, and Aurora, et cetera. And this is our uh, event webpage uh, link here. Um, as of, it is because it's portable, so it's also flagged as part of our uh, NERSC or our CF, ARCF performance portability series. Been running uh, lots of events. Uh, some of them are itself series, such as a uh, HIP series, OpenMP series here. And we had an uh, OpenMP offload earlier. We had Sicko, Raja, um, Rax, Cocos, and a few like Sick uh, another Sicko and Julia have been um, planned out in June. So check out this uh, portability series as well. Um, all these things have happened, have slides and record recordings on each of the event websites. Here, let's introduce our speakers. We're fortunate to have Michael Clam and Christian Turbovan here from Germany. Um, both of them are OpenMP Language Committee members. They're among a group of experts who regularly give technical talks, tutorials at Supercomputing, International Supercomputing, um, I, I International Workshop of OpenMP and other H HPC centers, venues, etc. on OpenMP. So Dr. Christian Turbovan is the lead, he leads HPC group at RWTH Arhan University as senior scientist. And within OpenMP, he's the co-chair of the OpenMP Affinity Subcommittee. He has co-authored a book, uh, Using OpenMP, The Next Step, published by MIT Press. Dr. Michael Clem is the principal member and technical staff in the Compilers, Languages, Runtime and Tools team of Machine Learning and Software Engineering Group at AMD. Uh, within OpenMP, he's the CEO of the OpenMP Architecture Review Board, who oversees the organization and, and approves the specification uh, release, etc. He also is the leader of the lead author of the book, High Performance Parallel Runtimes, Design and Implementation. So thank you so much for uh, agreeing to offer us this full spectrum of OpenMP tutorial for our users. And here's a quick uh, session and topics. So today covers OpenMP introduction, and then followed by tasking and NUMA and SIMD, and then a guest session from uh, Ruth Vanderpuss on um, what could possibly go wrong using OpenMP, then followed by two sessions of OpenMP offload, any remaining select topics such as MPI, uh, OpenMP, and more advanced um, topics that, um, that I didn't cover in the previous sessions. So we'll have homework assigned for each session, and then they'll be reviewed at the next session. Um, and as the session goes on, it's becoming more advanced over time. Some logistics here first. Um, everyone is muted, uh, the large number of attendees here. Then uh, we would like to record who you are. So please change your name as first name, last name, and then username if you have one at FNERSC. Um, You can do so by click participants and then more next to your name to rename yourself. We have enabled uh, closed captioning and you can toggle on and off and also define a, a menu set view for transcript. So if you want to turn that on, you can even save the transcripts for, for your view later. So all the nurse trainings are recorded. Um, if you feel free to um, raise your hand and when we ask you, you can unmute and ask questions. Or if you feel shy, um, you can just tap your questions in into the Slack channel. And then we will uh, either enter them there or uh, bring them up to the session uh, live. Uh, we have uploaded slides already. Recording needs a few days to uh, pro post process, but they'll be also um, uploaded to the with the link onto the event page. So if you haven't joined uh, Slack yet, we'll be using Slack during throughout the, uh, the, the training sessions uh, for Q&A. And there's a general session for any questions, discussions. There's also a promoter account session um, channel for anything related to training accounts or anything uh, using promoter specifically. Uh, I will post the link uh, on Zoom uh, in a while. Um, although this is a free Slack, so uh, they, after 90 days, messages will go off B 
uh, dropped off. But then we will capture some important messages, um, questions, maybe into a Google Doc and, and publish the Google Doc link for you. And also I will put a, a survey link onto the Zoom. Uh, if you can click on that link and then let that window set on your uh, laptop or then after the event, you can fill, uh, help us to fill out the survey. So we very much in, take your survey in seriously so it can help us to improve our future trainings. There's a question about hands-on. So if you do want to you know, hold on to the survey for a few days after hands-on, that's fine. We'll remind you in Slack channel. Um, so lastly, we want to remind everybody nurse code of conduct. So we collaborate and we uh, we we take team science, service, trust, innovation, respect um, as um, as our user code of conduct uh, aspects. We agree to work together professionally and productively. And if you find anything, you know you want to report. If there's any viol um, report any violations, feel free to email us nurse training at lbl.gov. And you can find the bo in the bottom for through the link or search uh, nurse code of conduct um, for any uh, detailed information. Uh, today's session is an hour and a half um, uh, for the re official presentation. And then the last 30 minutes, uh, anyone wants to stay longer to you know, start logging and try to, uh, um, try to compile a code and we're here to help you, especially if you haven't had a nurse account previously. So this is part of my welcome and I'm done. And Suzanne from Oak Ridge, those are our co-organizers, um, want to say something about, uh, especially for Oak Ridge. So Suzanne, go ahead, please. Thanks, Helen. So for our o OLCF users, if you have access to OLCF resources, we'll have an office hour to help you with homework and any questions you have about porting this to OLCF resources. It will be on May 16th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, so much earlier for you West Coast people than one o'clock. Uh, that link is there in the chat and it's also in the Slack. Thanks for giving me a minute to advertise, Helen. You're welcome. So with that, I'm going to um, pass the session to our speakers, Christian and Michael. Go ahead, launch your slides and introduce OpenMP and introduce yourself if you want to. more. <laughs> Christian, go for it. I go first. Okay, let me then just share the screen. So, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. However, for us, it's a good evening, everyone. Yeah, but I guess it doesn't uh, matter here. So, Helen introduced us already. Michael, do we have to add anything? No, I was pretty happy. Thank you, Helen, for the accolades. Okay, very good. Uh, just one thing. So Helen said that we are working on OpenMP and we are around for quite a while. So this is why we are whatever senior this and that. Yeah, you can probably also recognize it from our faces, but that's a chance. So that means if you have a question, in particular, if we come to the more advanced topics in the next courses and you ask yourself, why is it the way it is? Yeah, and uh, couldn't this have been done in any different way? Don't uh, feel, um, don't hesitate to ask. Yeah, we might have a background story or maybe even a really good reason why things are in OpenMP the way they are. Yeah? So this is an invite really to ask questions. I think um, uh, Helen gave you an overview about uh, all those uh, seven sessions, including the one I like the title best. What could possibly go wrong using OpenMP? Of course, nothing yeah, if you follow our rules. But uh, today we really start, have a slow start. I hope that uh, translates uh, from my German to you. Uh, so we uh, give you an overview about OpenMP, what it is and maybe what it's not. Uh, and we will cover the fundamentals like the parallel region, the work sharing, that means putting threads to work, talking about scoping, uh, that means managing the data environment, differentiating between shared and private variables and then give you an overview about uh, tasking in OpenMP, which is uh, uh, maybe for some people already an advanced topic and uh, that will be covered in more detail, uh, actually in all detail, I believe in session two, and then talk about uh, the homework. That means exercises that we have prepared, uh, which are simple enough so that you do not have to deal with any algorithms, data structures and so forth, but you can focus on uh, the, the topics at and yeah, that means putting an OpenMP in there and later on uh, applying tasking, optimizing for NUMA, SIMD, and so forth. And uh, 
all examples are available in C and C++, and I believe most uh, are also available in Fortran. So let's start with the overview here. And uh, this is a history slide. So uh, OpenMP um, is also already a senior, senior programming model, if you like to say so. What's the important message here is that it's a standard that's still alive. So we have a regular release schedule. Michael can uh, give you all the details about that. Um, but you have, uh, but you're seeing that uh, since recent years, it's more or less a regular uh, schedule. And most importantly, for this year's SC, that means in the November uh, or winter time frame, we are expecting to release OpenMP version six. Today, what we are covering is uh, the basics, the first versions of OpenMP, and uh, starting to talk about OpenMP three. And in the next few webinars, we are adding features that have been introduced later on. And that's already an important message that um, um, whatever you learned about OpenMP in the past is still around yeah, if you look into the newer versions of the standard. And this is uh, a figure actually from uh, Hult van der Paas. You will hear him later on. So it kind of uh, or it tries to describe what open MP is, and depending from where you come from or depending from where you look at it, it might look really different. So today we are talking about managing threads and assigning loop distributions to threads. This is what OpenMP was invented for, if I'm allowed to say so, and this is still around. However, um, next time or by the end of today, we will talk about tasking in OpenMP, which is a completely different approach of thinking in parallel. Later on, we will explore SIMD. Um, we will talk about memory management and stuff like that. So what I'm trying to say here is that OpenMP consists of many, many different things. And this is good. Yeah. So it might look overwhelming, but OpenMP, to the best of my knowledge, is the only programming model that covers, I would say, all aspects of modern compute nodes and provides a, a well-defined semantic. That means what happens if you combine all those aspects, like if you combine SIMD vectorization with threading, how can you manage uh, heterogeneous memory and offload to GPUs and so forth? So if you would not use OpenMP and instead use threading mechanism A, compiler extension B, you might be lucky, but instead, uh, but with the next release of the compiler, switching to a different compiler and so forth, you might run out of luck. So I believe as a user, this is my selling point of OpenMP, that it provides a clear semantic and a uh, feature set that is uh, well integrated. And we hope to make that clear throughout all the uh, sessions in this tutorial. Just a few practical um, remarks. If you want to work on the exercises, don't look into the specifications. Not sure if Michael agrees. But instead, look into the quick reference cards, so the syntax reference cards. So our slides mostly are designed to um, be problem-based. So that means we have very simple examples, and we just uh, sketch some code. We do not provide all the syntax uh, and all the possible clauses for all the constructs, statements, and uh, API routines, and environments, variables, and so forth. So our goal is to teach you the con concepts and then you can look up the details in these uh, reference cards. They are available for C and C++ or for Fortran. Uh, they are uh, updated for all versions of OpenMP and they are available from openmp.org. And then you go to the specification section, if I remember correctly, where you find both the official specification, uh, these uh, reference guides, and also a set of examples also curated for every version of OpenMP. If you like books, yeah, there's a printed copy of the 5.2 specification. My personal opinion is this is not, not for programmers. Uh, however, uh, it contains all the information you might possibly need. Uh, there's a book yeah, where I'm involved in and said it already. It's a book that covers all of the features up to OpenMP version 4.5. I believe it's a good book with many examples. It's in uh, um, yeah in, in serious need for an update. Uh, and I believe to some extent people are working on that. Um, but if you need a more um, basic introdu introduction, 
This is a book that Helen is involved in. There's the Open P Common Core, which focuses on what the authors believe is the most important part of Open P, namely the Common Core. And uh, in, it provides a, uh, I would say, practical step by step um, uh, description yeah, to explore all those features with many examples, where the, the book in the middle um, is a little bit more advanced. Okay, for a reason I don't understand. Ah, now my slides continue. Yeah, so this was a basic uh, uh, overview. Now let's uh, dive into OpenMP. And the most important and also most fundamental concept in OpenMP, and so easily it will not go away, uh, is the so-called parallel region. This is a figure of the OpenMP machine model. Not sure if, if one could call it an official figure, but this is where uh, how system looked like when OpenMP was kind of invented. So it's a figure that came with official documentation, uh, documentation from Sun Microsystems when they had the four socket UltraSpark 3 based system. So these four sockets were representing four single core processors. Uh, this was what people were programming for when OpenMP version 1 and 2 and so forth were released. So these processors also had caches and they were connected to the shared memory. We are a crossbar, a bus, or whatever interconnect. Is this still valid? Yeah, if we take this model and make it a little bit more uh, detailed, what we would see is that uh, in the typical HPC node, we might have two sockets only. But each socket has 60, 80, or maybe even 100 cores. We have a cache hierarchy, and we have a non-uniform, meaning NUMA, uh, memory architecture. But oops, I'm sorry. But still, yeah, um, the, the fundamental design is the same. We have a set of processors or core. We have caching. That means data are stored in between. And uh, all these processing elements have access to a shared memory even though it might be uh, hierarchical or it might be heterogeneous and so forth. And we will add this complexity over the course of this core. The fundamental idea is still the same. OpenMP employs multiple threads that run on these individual processors or cores in order to speed up the execution of your program. And uh, Michael, I see there's some activity in Slack and also uh, questions in the chat. So I assume if I have to pause in between, you will interrupt me. Can you just confirm? Yes, I will do so. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now let's take a look at the OpenMP memory model. And uh, as you can see on the right-hand side of this slide, this is already a complication over what has been introduced with OpenMP uh, in the early days or in the early versions. So the funda fundamental idea here is, let me use my laser pointer here is that we have a shared memory. This is where you put your important data structures. Let's think of a very simple example, a matrix vector multiplication. And let's assume the matrix and also the vector are large enough so that it pays off to do this matrix vector multiplication in parallel. Yeah, obviously, the matrix will be put into the shared memory. We have the right-hand side, the vector, and the left-hand side is also a vector, which is a result. And um, we will uh, we can express parallelism over the rows of the matrix. So that means each thread will multiply the row of the matrix element-wise with the right-hand side and store the result in the left-hand uh, side. So the matrix, without doubt, uh, will sit here, the right-hand side, depending on your system. But in the modern system, most probably, it will sit in the cache and also the local slice of the uh, result vector. What does it mean that we have private memory? Yeah, so by the way, the T's mean we have multiple OpenMP threads running here. Sorry, I sort of said that. What does it mean that we have private memory in here as well? Threads can have private memory that's only accessible by those threads uh, that own the memory in order to store local. And later on, we will refer to that private variables. And that's really important. Yeah? Think of our matrix vector multiplication. If we parallelize over the rows of the matrix, each thread needs its own, let me call it the row index variable. Yeah, that's uh, typically a variable named i in the loop. So every thread is uh, in need for its own i variable because otherwise, yeah, if there would be a single i only, they would iterate 
uh, all over the same iteration space. So if we need yeah, different values of a given variable for different threads, then these will go into the private memory. Now two remarks. So one is in C and C++ and probably in Fortran, yeah, it's uh, kind of simple by using pointers, for example, to gain access to another thread's private memory. You can do so, it might work, but in doing so, you would violate the uh, requirements uh, of the OpenMP specification. That means you would break the rules of OpenMP and that will result in undefined behavior. And that basically means it could work, yeah, but next time it could break or it will break out of the box. That's also um, a possibility. So private memory uh, is uh, intended to be private whenever a thread needs its own value um, or partial result or something like that in a private variable. Now, how is private, uh, uh, how will whatever, at some point private memory be resolved? That means uh, data will be written back into the main memory. So for that, you have to understand that OpenMP is kind of a weak memory model. That means if a thread makes a modification in this shared matrix or in the result vector, this modification will not be immediately visible by all the other threads. Why is it? And I think of the system architecture. If you multiply a matrix element with a vector element, the result will first be in the register of the processor, then it will be in a cache, and sooner or later, later it might be uh, end up in the main memory. That's for the thread performing the operation. Assume now the viewpoint of the thread uh, trying to read this value. It has to query, yeah? or you know, query is the wrong word. Um, it might not. Um, be immediately notified about the uh, updated result. Um, it might not, uh, if it's just looking at the main memory and not see the result because it's still in the uh, cache hierarchy on the way to the main on the way to the main memory and uh, so forth. This is all well defined. We have cache coherency protocols and so forth, which is outside the scope of this lecture, except for when we're dealing with NUMA to some extent. But what has to be remembered is that this data transfer between writing back data from private memory to the shared memory and so forth is transparent to the programmer and it's only being guaranteed after a synchronization construct. So that means whenever threads have uh, passed, that means completed synchronization constructs in OpenMP, only then it's guaranteed uh, for them to have the same view of the main uh, of the shared memory. That means only then they are consistent. It's even a little bit more complex when we look at the accelerator memory and processing units and so forth, but we will cover that later on. So now finally, yeah, only one slide away from the first OpenMP example, let's look at the OpenMP execution model. So we start with, oops, the initial thread. Yeah, we renamed that from the master thread. Nowadays, it's the initial thread. And an OpenMP program consists of a sequence of so-called parallel regions in which the initial thread plus a set of worker threads together form what we call a team of threads. So the initial thread plus a worker thread form the team of threads, important terminology. A parallel region, we will see it on the next slide, I believe, has a start and an end point. And in between, the program continues with the initial uh, thread in a, what we call a serial part. So that means an OpenMP program consists of a sequence of parallel regions, which may or may not have the same number of threads. But in between, you see that those lines yeah, intended to indicate threads are dotted. And that's to some extent the magic of OpenMP. The runtime is managing this, these teams of threads. So it's not destroying the threads at the end of the parallel region, but instead putting the threads to sleep. You might even influence how deep they sleep and so forth. So there's a lot of cleverness that subsequent parallel regions and other constructs come with very low overhead. So in theory, you could program all the constructs that you're going to explore in this webinar on your own, but uh, uh, be assured that into modern implementations, meaning compilers, runtimes, and so forth, many, many uh, person years have been invested to make it efficient on a wide range of architectures. And also the runtime is con uh, constantly being ported to new systems. Um, so redoing this on your own typically is not as efficient if you want to target uh, 
uh, many different architectures. So there are many things that the OpenMP runtime is managing for you. It's not only the pro, uh, compiler plug mass, it's also the runtime. And we will see that later on. And finally, just as a, a remark, this idea of a pa going parallel and then going sequential again means uh, in computer science implements a fork join concept, but that means OpenMP enables so-called incremental parallelization. We can start from a sequential program add parallel regions and over time make it <coughs> a parallel program. Of course, never forget the Omdahl's law. So you gain efficiency only uh, if you extend the parallel regions to cover almost all of your parallel, uh, of your uh, program's runtime. Finally, here's the example. On the left-hand side, you see C, C++. On the right-hand side, you see uh, Fortran. So, OpenMP works with compiler directives. In C and C++, these are pragmas. In, in Fortran, these are those, uh, whatever, differently styled comments, uh, followed by the OMP. And in C and C++, the beginning of the parallel region is marked by the opening curly brace. The end is marked by the closing curly brace. In Fortran, it's a parallel to the end parallel uh, that marks the so-called structured block. The structure block is required to have only one entry point at the bottom, one exit at, at the top, I'm sorry, one exit at the bottom, branching in or out is not really allowed. And uh, um, yeah, uh, whatever. In C++, um, uh, managing of exceptions and so forth, all this has been has to be handled within the parallel region um, because uh, the there's no um, definition yeah, on how to carry that outside. If something really bad happens in your parallel region, uh, the only chance is to terminate uh, your program. Yeah? So error management either has to be happen inside the parallel region or outside, but crossing boundaries is uh, really tricky. And uh, in short, um, the technical reason for that is that there's some kind of magic, meaning calls to the OpenMP runtime happening here and there. And if you would skip that, the resulting behavior is undefined. Michael, do you want to add something? No? OK, nope. sorry. Perfect explanation. Just uh, something important. Um, most codes are written in a way that you do not assume a certain number of threads. And I believe this is really important. Never code for a given number of threads, be it 4 or 64, because a few la year la years later, yeah, chances are high that your program will run on a different hardware. In OpenMP, we have an environment variable or a clause or an API construct that is used to determine the number of threads um, that uh, will be used in, by the OpenMP runtime whenever your program is being started. So only num threads uh, is what most people use at the environment variable. Uh, so if you set it to four, your program, program will run with the initial thread plus three worker threads. That means a team consists of in total four threads. Or you use the num threads clause or a corresponding API call to override the setting. And I have an example on, uh, on that in the next few minutes. But first, Michael will take over and tell you about how OpenMP compilers uh, are being used. OK, quick interlude. <clears throat> I muted. Can you hear me? OK, good. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Zoom just told me I'm, I was muted. All right. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to use OpenMP compilers and then show you one of our favorite examples, uh, a really complex code called Hello World. And we're going to walk through this uh, to see you know, what, what Christian was explaining to you. So uh, first thing is uh, there are many production compilers out there who offer OpenMP support. Um, probably it's all of them that matter in reality. So obviously the GNU compiler collection has it. Uh, LLVM, uh, both Clang and the now being developed Flang, LLVM Flang compiler um, offer OpenMP. Um, Flang is still in the works. Uh, then the HPE, uh, Gray Programming Environment has uh, full OpenMP support. If you're on an AMD machine, uh, we have AOCC. That's the compiler for the Epic CPUs that offers OpenMP. We have AOMP. That's our research software development compiler. 
uh, where we prototype OpenMP features for AMD GPUs. Uh, and then Rockham CC, that's the compiler that we ship with the Rockham software stack for AMD GPUs uh, that also has OpenMP support. If you are on an Intel machine, the Intel Classic compiler and next-gen compilers, I think now they are no longer called next-gen, but just compilers. So this is the current compiler product, um, has it. And uh, IBM XL is another uh, that also has OpenMP support. If you're interested in you know, what else we have in the OpenMP context in terms of tools, compilers, and debuggers and whatnot, please go to the OpenMP.org website uh, where we do host a list of compilers uh, and other tools that we know about as the OpenMP ARB um, and that we try to maintain on a yearly basis. So we query all the vendors that we know who have OpenMP-based products. Um, and um, query them so that we can update that website. Um, so, you know, it's 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 a good, uh, rather comprehensive list. And um, I'm going to say it, uh, kudos to Helen, who maintains, effectively maintains this list by chasing down all the vendors and making sure that they uh, respond in, in due time and provide all the information that we need to host this website. So thank you, Helen, for that. All right, so <clears throat> how to use it? Uh, well, I mean, almost all compilers these days follow the um, sort of the new command line options. So pretty much all of the compilers in some shape or form accept dash F OpenMP to enable OpenMP, OpenMP support and enable the compiler to recognize uh, the OpenMP directives or pragmas. Um, Prey uh, has a HOMP as a different spelling. And then I believe Intel um, has now FI OpenMP uh, to have a special runtime support for um, OpenMP. And also the IBM XL compiler uses a different syntax to enable OpenMP. So please uh, consult your uh, respective compiler manual uh, to look at this and figure out what is the right option to use. But as a first attempt, F OpenMP is, is probably a good choice. Uh, the one thing I, I need to say is that the switches have to be passed to both the compiler and the linker. Um, Christian already kind of hinted at this, that OpenMP typically has compiler support to recognize the programming language and the directives. Uh, but we also have an extensive runtime system underneath that does all the matching, as he called it, but also that provides the corresponding user level APIs uh, to interact with the OpenMP runtime state. And so to when you pass F OpenMP to the compiler, it basically enables the compiler to recognize the directives and pragmas and produce parallel code. And then at link time, when you pass dash F OpenMP, uh, the linker driver basically adds all the required libraries so that you can actually link uh, an OpenMP program and run it uh, on the machine so that it would actually do something in parallel. All right, and then uh, Christian already said this and I'm gonna pick it up uh, in, in my little demo that I prepared. So you can either set this environment variable on num threads to some arbitrary value, uh, positive value and larger than zero, obviously, um, so that you can pick the number of threads at runtime. Um, there's different flavors how you can do that depending on which shell you're using. And in some case, it may actually also come from the queuing system and the batch system that allocates the nodes to your jobs uh, so that your OpenMP application is, is kind of configured the right way. Again, please consult the manual of the respective machine that you're using. If you don't say anything, OpenMP will make a, a good guess which basically is it will look at the machine that has been allocated to you and it will basically assume that you want to grab all the available cores and hardware threads and set the number of threads to that value and basically use it. All right, and then I, uh, like I said uh, and promised, here is uh, a tiny bit of code. Um, and since I'm a Fortran person, I'm going to, I'm going to start with Fortran. So this is a very sophisticated code, like I already called it out. Uh, this is Hello World. And what it's supposed to do is 
with what I said that OpenMP will grab all the cores. It will print as many times Hello World as I have cores in my system. And when I do this, um, so this is the command line for this. So hello is the output, hello.f90 is the input. I turn on dash f open mp, and this time I'm not splitting across compiler and linker. I'm using uh, the compiler to basically uh, do both, both in one step. That takes a bit because my flang is hosted on NFS in my home office. So after a little while, with the NFS pulling data from my shared drive, I can type in hello, and it will print uh, eight times hello world. This is a four core mini Ryzen with SMT turned on. So that's eight hardware threads. I can do the same. Oh, there's one thing I, I wanted to say because Christian said uh, in OpenMP, you have to have uh, directive omp parallel and directive omp end parallel. With more modern compilers, we also nowadays support uh, writing block and end block. So uh, that's kind of the Fortran way of writing curly braces. Um, I I'm not going to try it. I don't know if Lang New already supports that, uh, but this is already supported in the OpenMP specification. And at some point, it will also materialize um, in the compilers. If you're more a C type person or C++ type person, so here's a bit of C code that uh, effectively does the same. So, you know, this is now a compiler pragma. I'm using a structured block. Um, the one thing that uh, Christian did not explain though, uh, a structured block in C and C++ terminology is either a single statement. So I could also write it that way. Or if I want, want to have multiple statements in a sequence, then I would have to put the curly braces to tell the OpenMP compiler that it should group uh, the following sequence of statements into one uh, parallel block. And if I do this, uh, here's the command line for Clang. Again, f OpenMP, a single command line. And if I do this, uh, you again get printed hello world. So that's kind of nice. Now, one thing that I'm going to show you and uh, we, we're going to work on this throughout this uh, today's session. So what if, what if I do this, right? So I'm going to slightly modify this example so that it has two printfs, um, one that prints hello and the other one printing world and the new line. So let's see what that does. That worked. Try it again. That didn't work so well. Okay, so it now prints something like hello, hello world, hello world, world. Uh, I've seen cases where it didn't print anything um, except, you know, a bunch of new lines somewhere. So, you know, it's weird. So it doesn't exactly do what, it, what we want. So there must be some underlying issue. Look at that. Now it worked again. Let's try it again, worked again. Ah, didn't work so well again. So you're experiencing what we will uh, later call race condition. And today we're gonna show you how to actually fix that. And um, Christian is actually going to do this. Back to you. Yes, can you just leave uh, the example code open? So there was a question, what is uh, keeping the threads from writing out of order? I think Michael, you just explained, there's nothing that keeping the threads from writing out of order order. So two lessons to take away here. First, if you go parallel, stop making any assumption about the order in which certain things are happening. Yeah? What is determining the order? It's the operating system, yeah? mostly. And this thing doesn't have any clue about what you try to um, achieve. Then second is, why do we see Hello World a world hello, but not complete character garbage. So that's a question, uh, takeaway number two. If you call external code from within your program, you should try to understand what could, po what could possibly happen or what will happen. I think that's a better term. When, um, the, um, when the code is called from within multiple threads, yeah, first 
multiple threads, and then second, possibly at the same time. So STDC out sooner or later will call uh, printf, will sooner or later call fprintf on a file named std out. And this is where something happens that we will refer to as synchronization. So there's a lock behind you know, or whatever synchronization construct that will make sure that these individual words, hello or the world, including the new line character, will be uh, written as a whole to that file. Yeah? Even though Michael is using Windows at the end of the day, the output is a file. Yeah? And uh, that means this code is what is called thread safe. So we will not guarantee that hello world is being written, but it will guarantee that if you print this certain string, this will be written as a, as a whole yeah, without interruption. And that's a guarantee that the C, C++, and also Fortran standard libraries will make. I hope that uh, uh, answers these questions. With that, I believe, Michael, I will take over, right? Yes, sir. So there's another question in, in Slack. Mm -hmm. uh, out. Isn't OpenMP always parallel? Why is it necessary to add the word parallel to program my ONP parallel? So the idea of OpenMP is to implement fork join parallelism, and it will do the fork. That means go parallel whenever a parallel region is being encountered. If you don't add that, yeah, the initial thread will just execute your program. So that means you have a sequential uh, execution. It's not always parallel. There's no there's no magic. It's all you you have to tell what is parallel. Or if we say OMP program OMP single, then a single thread will run. Okay. Shall I continue? Uh yes. Um okay. I take this as a yes. Good. So what did we do now? We print in parallel, hello world, yeah, without avoiding complete character garbage. That's good news. But we actually want to speed up the execution of our program. And the, um, the most important or the most fundamental way to do that in OpenMP is called work sharing. It means we have a, a couple of constructs, although we will discuss uh, the Fortran, uh, the four and the single only in this course, to distribute work among the team of threads. And the for work sharing construct and correspondingly the do work sharing construct in Fortran um, are the most important ones because most program time is typically spent in loops unless you're writing whatever, an operating system kernel or something like that. And uh, if we have loop iterations that are on some in some way independent, Again, this will be discussed in more detail later on. So if we have the, uh, this independence in between the loop iterations, then we can execute them in parallel on multiple threads. And uh, this is the OMP4 construct in uh, C and C++ and the do construct in Fortran. So it will take the iterations of this loop and distribute these iterations over the participating team of threads. But to come back to this question earlier on, we need a team of threads. We need a parallel um, before. So why is that important? I believe I said it loops often account for most of a program's runtime. So let me explain in more detail. This is our pseudocode. Looks a lot like Fortran, I believe. Iterates from 0 to 99 and element-wise performing A equals B plus C. This is a very simple picture of the LF of the three vectors, A, B, and C in the memory. And uh, now let's assume we execute our program with four threads. What will happen? The compiler has prepared this I loop such that the loop iterations can be distributed to any given number of threads. Yeah? And uh, as Michael has shown you, we can use the OMP num threads environment variable to then determine how many threads will be used. If we set it to one, there will be only the initial thread. If we set it to 55, there will be 55 threads in total in the team. One initial thread plus 54 worker threads and so forth. Now let's assume OMP num threads is set to four. Then thread zero will iterate from zero to 24. Thread one or two in this figure, so we will iterate from 25 to 49 and so forth. And we can see that these 
um, chunks and in consequence also all loop iterations are independent because the threads are reading from um, distinct uh, slices or partitions, I guess that's a better term, of C and B in writing to independent, again, uh, uh, partitions of the array A. So we really have independent loop iterations. What's the goal of it? Well, the goal is to actually speed up our program. Yeah, let's assume we would do this for more than 100 elements, yeah, like millions um, and so forth, and it could take some time. And if we do it in parallel, and if we can load the memory fast enough, then we can speed up the execution of this program. In order to explain the following uh, source code, I need um, one synchronization construct, which is called the barrier. And uh, that means, or this um, ensures that all threads in the team wait to reach the barrier before they are allowed to continue. So let me say that again to make sure I didn't make a mistake. A barrier can only be passed after all threads have reached the barrier. There are explicit barriers or implicit barriers. And explicit means you write it into your code. Implicit means it's uh, invisible, but it's there. So there's an implicit barrier that you cannot get rid of at the end of every parallel region yeah, in the join. But there are also implicit barriers um, at every work sharing construct, like the for and the do. Why is that? Assume that you have two work sharing constructs following each other. Uh, by default, yeah, the barrier ensures that the first one is fully completed before you start the next one. But later on, we will show you that you can add a clause in order to get rid of this barrier uh, if you understand what you're doing. So the default uh, is a little bit on the safe side. I need another work sharing construct, although it's not about speeding up the program, but it's a work sharing construct, which is called single. Again, this consists of a structured block. Yeah? And the single construct ensures that this structured block is executed once by a single thread only. It doesn't really de uh, define which thread will execute the single. So this is up to the runtime. For the most implementations I've looked at, it will be the thread that arrives there first. So if a thread arrives there, it will execute the structured block. All the other threads arriving sooner or later will jump around, wait at the end of the single construct because it's a work sharing construct. And that means uh, it contains an implicit barrier. Yeah? It's invisible, but it's there. And we need this in order to do IO, uh, like printing to the command line within a parallel region to set up memory yeah, that we want to allocate. So if we have a shared pointer and you want to allocate a matrix within a parallel region, typically only one thread uh, is the one that has, or uh, there's typically only one thread that is, has to call malloc uh, and so forth. And we will also make extensive use of that in the context of task parallel programming uh, as we will see later on. There's also the master construct, which will be deprecated in Oldman P6, but we include it here because it's uh, used in uh, many different programs. Uh, and it's confusing and also politically not correct anymore, if I understand correctly. So master means we will select the initial thread to execute the structured block. And it's not a work sharing construct, so that means there's no uh, barrier at the end, uh, which differs from single, which is a work sharing construct. That means there's an implied barrier uh, at the end. There's a replacement for the master construct, which is a masked construct, really hard to pronounce for me as a German. And uh, we will add details on that uh, later on. Yeah. So hopefully you will uh, just remember that this is there and what it does, yeah, but never write the code with it because it will be deprecated in OpenMP6 and then will go away in future versions and implementations. Now let me put all this into a single example. I have to change my screen share here. Let me hope this is the right window. Yes, and let me also increase the font size a little bit. Okay, I hope you can read that. So this is a C++ example. It's a vector addition. So let me run you through that. 
So here we have a constant variable, which is a dimension of the vectors A, B, and C that we are going to use. Then this is a C++, so we allocate vectors A, B, and C of type double, 64-bit uh, floating point with a given dimension. Then we have a parallel loop, which is this one that initializes the vectors. This is important in NUMA. We will cover that in two months or so. A is set to zero, B to one, C to two. Yeah, we're not caring about the uh, values here. And then we have the main loop that starts in line 35 and ends in line 51. So we call OMP get W time, which gives us a time as a double value. Um, but the W stands for the wall clock. Yeah, this is a time that's passing at a clock that's uh, hanging on the wall behind you or in front of you or wherever. That means a real time. And here we call it again. Yeah, and we subtract the first value. So that means we have a time measurement loop that tells us how long did we spend in this uh, part here. Now let's take a closer look. We have a parallel region that begins here, consists of a single construct and a four work sharing construct. And then here we have the end of the parallel region. Single, yeah, let's remember only once we will execute it. So it will print computation started with OMP get num threads. It's an API call that determines how many threads are active in the current parallel region. Threads and making sure that this is being printed to the command to the standard output immediately yeah, with a flush. Then we have the OMP4 which will iterate from zero to I dimension and execute the um, code as I was showing earlier. So this is putting everything together. One important uh, note here, we have a parallel region that starts here that gives us a team of thread. And then this work sharing construct, the single, and that work sharing construct, the four, both bind or apply to this parallel region. So we create the team of thread once and then have multiple parallel regions, uh, multiple work sharing constructs in there. Oops, come on, sorry for that. Thick fingers. Again, I compile the code. You um, can make it a little bit bigger font, so it'll be more helpful. Thank you. Even bigger font. Is it better? It's good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, later on. If open MP published on YouTube, it's big to be good, but be more um, accessible. Okay. And my program now is called a dot one a dot out. So with the single thread, it takes three point seven seconds. Now let let's hope yes we get in a speed up with two threads, so one point. Uh, eight and with a little bit of luck, yeah, we go below one second, no, uh, 0 0.1 second with four uh, threads. Well, we are close, but it's an interactive machine. So there are also other people uh, on it, probably consuming something of our memory bandwidth. So what I was showing earlier, yeah, we have this do loop on the slide, it was from zero to 99. In my code, it was from zero to whatever million, I forgot. And um, the four work sharing construct distributes the loop iterations over the participating threads in the team. And we determine the degree of parallelism. That means how many threads will be active at runtime. That means after our program has been compiled with the OMP num threads environment variable. Yeah, and uh, this is how we can achieve a speed up. We will come back to this kind of operation when we look at the memory bandwidth. Any questions on this code that is urgent that I should answer now? Also looking at Michael and Helen, did you notice anything? Uh, there were a bunch of uh, more general questions in Slack that I already took care of. So um, nothing with respect to your slides at this point. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Then let's go back to the presentation. Oh, someone has raised his or her hand. Yes, please. Hi. Um, could you perhaps say a bit about where the um, the array data is being stored with respect to the different processors that are acting upon it? Like, are they on all in shared memory or are they split across? 
applications so A, B, and C were allocated with malloc at the end of the day, or the C++ new constructor. So they are in a heap, which typically is a shared memory. I, I mean, which is a shared memory in the C and C++ pro program, which typically is a main memory in your machine, like the DRAM memory. It's right. a little bit more complex. Huh? So if we have a NUMA architecture, but that's chapter three. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Brian? Yeah, so um, normally um, I have a choice of like a couple of different ways to parallelize things. Either I can statically say, okay, I have a million elements and four threads, so each thread will process 250,000 elements. Or I can say, okay, all of the threads can compete and just race through as many elements as they personally can, and maybe one thread will process more and one will process fewer. And that takes more synchronization. But if you have like one slow thread, then you, you gain a lot that way. So I was wondering um, which way does, does this OMP4 happen? That's a very good question, which is up now yeah, on the on the next few slides, I believe. Okay, thanks. Yeah, if if I don't answer your question, um, let me know afterwards. Uh, Christian, there's actually a question that you will you probably want to answer online. So Pragma on parallel four applies to the single for loop following it. It is going to or is it going to find if the very next four, meaning there is. Uh, if there are other lines between this directive and four, it will ignore them and apply to the for loop it finds first. So it's not allowed to have other lines in between. So the OMP four or the parallel, uh, the OMP parallel four apply to the next for loop, which actually has to follow next. Yeah. So if you have other statements in between, that's a syntax error that the compiler will complain. Did I understand that correctly, the question? Yes, yes thank, thank, you. You. thank you. So what's important, maybe I didn't make that clear. Pragma OMP parallel gives us a team of threads. Pragma OMP4 distributes the following for loop to the given team of threads. We need the parallel, otherwise we have only the initial thread. And we need the four in order to uh, distribute the loop iterations. And we combine that. So if we if there's only a single loop that we want to parallelize, we can write pragma on p parallel four on a single line. We call this a combined statement, uh, or a combined construct in OpenMP. The other option is to do as I did in the source code. We have a pragma on p parallel, the parallel region yeah, that spends uh, curly braces in C and C++, and then an OMP four without the parallel applying to the for loop or for loops within the parallel region if they're multiple. But we have some exercises later on, yeah, and we'll, uh, and, and you can try exactly these aspects in these exercises. So in the interest of time, yeah, let me continue. And uh, also to answer a question, how can we influence the loop scheduling? So the for construct in OpenMP allows us to influence how those iterations are uh, scheduled, that means distributed among the team of threads. And we can influence this with a so-called schedule clause. The default that I was explaining so far and showing, uh, and showing is uh, what most implementations use as the default, which is a schedule static with a closing parentheses. So static means the iteration space is divided into blocks of a certain size. I'll explain that in a few seconds. And then these blocks assigned, are assigned to the threads in a round robin fashion. If you have only four blocks, they go to the threads 0, 1, point, uh, 0, 1 2, and 3. If we have more blocks than threads, yeah, let's assume we have six blocks and four threads, they go to 0, 1, 2, and 3. Zero, one. This is what I mean, I refer to as round robin. Yeah? So it's a static distribution of those blocks of a certain chunk size to threads. What does chunk size mean? Chunk size means we group or we put multiple loop iterations together to form a chunk. That means a piece of work yeah? into a block here. And we can specify the chunk size with this optional chunk um, argument to the schedule clause. 
So if you put one in here or in there, I'm sorry, I touched my, oops. If you put one in here, the blocks, blocks will consist of only a single iteration. If you put four in there, yeah, the blocks will consist of four iteration. If you do not specify chunk, then the iteration space will be divided into as, sorry, here it is, into as many chunks as we have threads, yeah, which then corresponds to the example that I was showing earlier. So that one consecutive, um, one block per thread is being created with consecutive loop iterations. Why is that a reasonable default? Well, uh, when OpenMP was kind of born, yeah, linear algebra, in particular dense linear algebra, was probably the most important application uh, for these systems. And uh, that means we were accessing matrices and vectors very similar to the examples that I was showing. And if we distribute the work in this way, we can uh, make use of caches in an efficient way. That means if we access A0, yeah, the same thread will access A1, A2, and so forth. If these reside on a cache line, the data the, the, the um, amount of data that has been loaded from the memory is kind of minimal and that uh, cache lines are used in an efficient way. However, in some use cases, iterations have a different computational cost. Not in linear algebra, maybe in sparse linear algebra, depending on your data structures and the force. So if uh, um, the loop iterations have a different uh, computational cost, some threads would finish earlier than others. And this is referred to as a load imbalance. And unfortunately, since there's a um, barrier at the end of a parallel region and or the work sharing construct, we have to wait for the slowest thread before all the work has been completed. So we would like to address it. And this is what we have the schedule dynamic for. This will divide the iteration space into blocks, again, of chunk. If not specified, then one is a default. Yeah. And then these blocks are distributed to the threads in the way they finished with their previous work. So that means threads all grab their piece of work and then grab the next piece of work uh, whenever they are done. That means yeah, threads that uh, take longer for some chunks might in total execute a fewer um, number of chunks, or fewer chunks. That means a smaller number of chunks in total, but obviously then the more computationally expensive ones. Yeah? So the dynamic schedule um, aims to address load imbalances. There's also guided as a specialization, which is very similar to, the, to dynamic, but starts with an implementation defined value of chunk, which is then exponentially decreased during the course of the iteration to what you specified, or one. So the goal is to have in total a, few, a, a smaller number of blocks, which could slightly reduce the overhead of the schedule, yeah? still having a dynamic behavior leading uh, to uh, the avoidance of the load imbalance. However, I've never seen a code where this really makes a difference unless you have an artificially created uh, work distribution where the last few pieces uh, have the most, uh, the, the highest computational cost. The default is static, so the following slides will briefly illustrate that. Uh, so if we have the computational load here, so again, my access description is gone, sorry. And the number of iterations, yeah, then thread zero, or probably running of process zero, would, uh, would have to work the um, in total most. Yeah? That means the uh, most um, uh, computationally expensive work pieces would be assigned to thread zero, second most expensive set of uh, work items to process one and so forth. Uh, so I hope this graphical representation makes it clear that process three or thread three would uh, complete earlier than zero. And this is a load imbalance, so it could help to re, um, yeah, to change the work assignment. Um, and what is shown here is a round robin way with a chunk size of one, where the first work element uh, goes to thread, to the first thread, the second to the second thread, and so forth. And in the example of four threads, we have this round robin uh, behavior. Yeah. So this, yeah, could. In address a load imbalance, however, on cache-based systems, 
if you have uh, array data structures, this is really inefficient because um, elements of the same cache line would be used by different threads, which could work out well, depending on your cache architecture, but could also lead to fault sharing. But this is a story of a different uh, session. If you want to address the load imbalance, oops, yeah, let me explain that, sorry. Why is it the default? Well, I said the cache aspect already. Uh, in addition, the static schedule comes with almost no overhead. So there are papers on measuring the overhead in Oldman P, and it's really, really low. Yeah, Like it's a, whatever, a function call or loading a single uh, control data structure from a cache. It's really uh, low. However, it doesn't do dynamic workload balancing. So the, uh, the alternative uh, is a dynamic loop scheduling. I don't have a figure here, but uh, as I said before, the threads request a new block whenever they finish the previous uh, work item with a default chunk size of one. The advantage is here that we have an automatic workload distribution to address and to hopefully eliminate the load imbalance, but it comes with a slightly higher runtime overhead. Um, however, uh, de determining the right chunk size typically is essential for performance exactly for this cache reason uh, or caching reason. And later on when we discuss NUMA, then um, uh, optimizations are still possible. Uh, let me rephrase that, uh, but it's uh, harder because we can't predict which thread will be responsible for which uh, loop iterations. Okay, so now we are zooming in onto the final topic for today, which is about managing the data environment. But in order to motivate that, yeah, let's consider the following. We have understood and learned about the other way around. Learned about and understood the parallel construct and the for or in for the do construct. Now, can we sit down, parallelize all the four loops in our program and then expect um, great speed up? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Yeah. So let's take a look at uh, this code example here. Yeah. I said in the beginning, we can make use of work sharing for the do or for loops if the loop iterations are independent. Are the loop iterations deep independent in this example? Well, yeah, as we will see later on, this depends on the variable s. So. Let's uh, first consider we have only a single S yeah, because this variable is declared before the parallel region. What will happen is that two or more threads at the same time will load S, add up their partial uh, contribution, yeah, their individual A of I for different values of I, and then write, re write the result back. What will happen? Yeah, they might both more or less at the same time read S, but one thread will certainly write first and the other write later. And then it will overwrite the result of the first thread. So we have a lost update. And um, this depends on the scheduling of the threads. Uh, and if we have a parallel execution here, that means threads potential uh, will truly run in parallel, we'll end up with we call, what we call a data rise in, in computer science. So if in between two synchronization points, well, in this example, there are no synchronization thread points. We have uh, two or more threads, and at least one is writing to the memory location. The other thread could also write, but potentially only reads to it. Yeah? Then the result is not deterministic because we have a race condition among the threads. And if that manifests in the value of a variable, we call it a data race. And uh, I, I believe I explained that. So we are losing some partial results in here. If you look at this code, what is the compiler doing? Yeah, I was just, just saying. Sorry, you lost a uh, screen share. Now. I'm, I'm what? I lost my screen share? Right. Um, I can see this. No, no, it's not. <laughs> oh, it's not. So I have like two screens somehow. We went to the other one directly. You good? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, where was I? So I was saying we have an issue in this code. What will the compiler do? Well, it will do as you order. So it will generate parallel code that will lead to, in this example, a wrong result, unless you ask for a high optimization, which will eliminate S so that at the end of the day, the result is correct anymore. Yeah? So we have something like undefined behavior 
which is uh, also true from what the C and C++ standards say, or at least the C++ standard, if we have a data race in our program, then the result is undefined or the program is invalid. Uh, now, how you do you detect data races? I think Michael's examples um, early on on Hello World was giving a good indication. They are hard to catch because sometimes everything looks normal and only sometimes uh, the data race really manifests itself. There are tools for that. We might discuss it later on. Um, looking at your code, there's a simple test. If you run the code backwards, and uh, then, uh, and if you then come to the conclusion that the result is different, then the loop iterations certainly are not independent. That means you have to do something. However, this test alone is not sufficient. You know, here, if uh, with uh, proper synchronization, we could execute the loop iterations uh, backwards and still end up with the same result, namely the, namely the sum of all the array elements. So how can we address it? We can do that with synchronization or with managing the data environment. Let's try with synchronization first. Um, I, uh, uh, let me introduce the first synchronization construct, which is called the critical region. The critical region will be executed by all the threads, but only by one thread simultaneously. So that means it implements mutual exclusion. And it does so for all critical regions in the program with the same name. Yeah, so they can be in different compilation units if they have the same name or no name at all that counts as the same name. Then it means that at any point in time, only one thread may be allowed to be within this critical region. And the next thread is only allowed to enter after this one thread or the first thread has left the critical region. Yeah, this is defined as mutual exclusion. And we can make use of this to guard shared or critical resources in general. With that, we can solve our issue here. Yeah? So we can just put the update to the shared variable S into a critical region. Do you believe this scales well? Well, if an instructor is asking in this way, most in most cases, the answer is no. If you would run that on the operating system that Michael is using and look at the task manager, I believe this is still uh, available in Windows, you would see that all the cores are busy but you will not see any speed up of your program because all the cores would be busy waiting to enter the critical region. Don't let me blame Windows. It would use the wrong performance monitoring tool on Linux or Mac OS. Yeah, you would see the same. All the threads are busy, but they're busy waiting to enter the critical. But what we're doing here at the end of the day is often referred to as serial serialization. That means only thread is allowed to be active because of our, uh, let's say, over-restrictive synchronization. So it's correct, but it's not, uh, it's not providing any speed up anymore. Uh, so that means uh, we need something in between. And with that, I would like to open the, the final chapter for today, which is what we call scoping, yeah? uh, roughly translated to managing the data environment. I used those terms um, earlier. Yeah? So we have shared data and private data. And now, yeah, let me be honest, this in particular in the context of tasking is maybe the ugliest part of OpenMT. Yeah? It's dealing with correctness and programming is hard and uh, parallel programming is even harder because we can make these additional kinds of errors like data races or, or maybe even deadlocks, yeah? but we're not uh, considering them. Uh, today. So managing the data environment means we can decide if data are or remain shared, uh, data variables, I mean, are or remain shared, or if they go into the private memory of the threads. Technically, yeah, that might be the stack of the thread, but uh, looking at the memory model earlier on, we said threads have their private memory. In addition to us yeah, deciding, oh, I'm sorry, deciding on that, there are also default rules, yeah, which uh, uh, sound a little bit complicated at the at first sight, but uh, with a little bit of practice, uh, I believe you get used to it. So how can we decide? We can add private or shared clauses with a list of variables onto a parallel region or work sharing construct, and then the compiler will restructure the code for us 
so that the variable that uh, has been declared before the parallel region, for instance, will become a private variable. That means we have a private uh, one uh, instance of the variable for every thread. So let me explain. Shared means, yeah, if we say shared A, there will be only one A. And whenever any thread in the team says A, it will refer to the same variable, meaning memory address in the shared memory. And this is different from private. If we have a private variable B, that means every thread has its own copy of the variable, its own instance of the variable. Yeah, it can be a C++ class, so it will be constructed and so forth. So uh, that means whenever a thread is saying B, it will refer to its own private copy of the variable B. However, private variables in a parallel region are undefined by default and will be destroyed at the end um, of the parallel region. Yeah? That means if we have to save some data, or sorry, we might have to initialize private variables. And if you have to save um, data from a, parallel, uh, from a private region in the parallel region, we have to also accommodate uh, for that. The general default is that everything that has been declared before the parallel region is shared. Yeah? Michael will introduce class a little bit later and we'll discuss scoping in detail uh, next time. However, we also have seen that a couple of variables are private by default. In particular, loop control variables of four or in Fortran do constructs are private. If not, they would not iterate over individual iteration spaces. Yeah? So remember the four construct, we uh, distribute the loop iterations over the threads. That's what I said. That means every thread has its own kind of private iteration space. So that means every thread needs its own variable i in my examples. Non-static variables declared in the parallel region. In C and C++, these are variables of so-called automatic storage location. They are declared within the scope of the parallel region. These variables are private. That means there's one per thread. So how can you uh, memorize this general default and the non-static local variables uh, thing? Um, so I found a out here by experiment that the following explanation helps many people, although it's technically not quite correct. Yeah? But think of it as follows. If you encounter, if uh, the master thread, or sorry, the initial thread encounter, encounters a declaration before a parallel region, then this variable will be shared. That means there's only one instance, yeah, and all the threads will refer to the same variable. However, if the declaration is encountered by all the threads, that means within a parallel region, then these variables are private. That means they will end up at uh, this private memory of every individual thread. Yeah? Think of it as a stack of a thread. It helps people, although it's not uh, uh, completely correct. Then private, I said it before, means we have an uninitialized new instance of a variable. We can use the first private clause, which gives us a private variable, but then this private variable is initialized with the value of the original variable when entering or before entering the construct. Yeah? And finally, if we have a for loop or a do loop, we can make use of the last private variable. That means the value of the last loop iteration, the last logical one, is being written back to the master. Again, remember, when you think parallel, do not make any assumptions about the order. So the last logical loop iteration is not necessarily the last uh, iteration that's being executed. One very short remark on static variables. Oh, that was too short. <laughs> Sorry. If we have a static int i or a variable at the file scope or a save variable, we can't make them private. It is a reason that the, these variables are being created actually before main in C and C++ starts and will be destroyed only after main is completed. Yeah, so the address is to some extent being determined by the linker. We need something equivalent in OpenMP. That means we need a variable that's being created whenever a thread is being created and destroyed whenever the thread is finally destroyed, means at the end of the program, not being put to sleep. The equivalent is a thread private in C and C++ and in Fortran. And whenever we want to convert a static variable declaration to a thread private variable, we have to write this whenever we encounter this uh, declaration, yeah, which could be multiple times 
at the file scope or common block scope or module scope um, variable. However, ah, again too quick, try to avoid it. There's only one really good use case uh, that I've seen so far where you cannot avoid static variables. And this is when writing your own memory allocators. If you have another one, yeah, let me know. I'm happy to discuss it, but uh, really try to avoid static variables. There are some old books that tell you using static variables is faster. Uh, I don't believe this is true anymore with modern compilers. This was true uh, at the time when there was no OpenMP. Yeah? If you have existing code, there's thread private, but if you have control of the code, <coughs> don't use this. Anything to add from you, Michael, or any other experience? Uh, no, I mean, the other option is potentially if you have some globally shared state that is read only, that you initialize once when you start up the program and then you use it as a read only database. Yeah. If that's not your use case, then uh, static and safes are pure evil and should not be used because they really conflict with parallel programming. Thank you very much. Pure evil. I will remember that. But yeah, with this excurse, we still have to solve this thing. We want to get um, rid of the critical. So uh, in an interactive classroom way, I would ask you to fill out this code. Yeah? Now I will just give you a few seconds to think about it. So here I have S yeah, that I want to update, but I want to avoid the data race that I illustrated earlier. And I, I believe this. I hope this annotation now also works in a full screen mode. So what can I do? Yeah, so we can introduce a new variable here. Let me call it double uh, PS and let's initialize it. So P stands for private S. So that means I have a new variable. This is part of the parallel region. Yeah? And remember my, in German would call it the Eselsbrücke. Not sure if there's an English translation for that. The simple rule to figure out easily if a variable is private or shared. Yeah? If it's, uh, it will be private if the declaration is encountered by all the threads. So we say PS equals zero. It's encountered, the declaration is encountered by all the threads. And that means in consequence, it's a private variable. Now we say PS equals PS plus A of I, sorry, it's a little bit ugly, but I hope you get the idea. So now we do the computation with private variables. Every thread has its own instance of PS. That means every thread is computing a partial result, result namely the partial array sum. However, at the end of the parallel region, yeah, and you can see it, this is part of the structure block here. Oh, it was too quick. I didn't mean to do that. No. Oh, okay, something like this. Yeah, sorry, the PowerPoint was not reacting. Uh, at the end of the parallel region, all the private variables are being destroyed. That means here, there would be no single variable actually holding the um, uh, the global sum. So we need something in between. And now let me do this here. So we say pragma. On pay critical curly braces in between here we say s equals s plus ps. Yeah. So, and why do I believe this works much better? Well, let's assume <laughs> the array is longer than 100 elements. Yeah, then this is a long running computation that with this modification can be done in parallel. The threads work on their private variable S. However, we need some kind of synchronization. We have to combine the partial results into a global result. So we do this pragma be critical here at the end, but we do this only once per thread and it's a single addition and assignment. Yeah, read, add, assign or store. So that is uh, much less work than having a single uh, critical within every iteration. Yeah? So in, when we need a global result out of partial results, it's in, in many cases, uh, it's unavoidable to introduce 
uh, something like a critical or an atomic and so forth. Uh, there are more options that we will discuss later on. So it's unavoidable to use some form of synchronization. But the efficient parallel programming is about minimizing this uh, overhead. So what technically happens is out of this loop, yeah, with a signal S, we end up with a whatever. Then, uh, let me move that a little bit. With an S1 equals S1. Yeah, and we have an oops, S2 equals S2. Yeah? So I guess uh, I hope you get the idea. OK, let me get rid of the annotations. That didn't work. Clear. Clear all my drawings. Did it? Come on. It worked. And uh, this is very similar yeah, to what I just uh, interactively added. Uh, I just wanted to do that in order to add the explanation. So we introduce a private L and so forth. So I can't see your faces, yeah, but think for a moment. Is this a great solution? Well, on the one hand, yeah, if you trust me, it gives us very good um, performance and it's a correct code. But on the other hand, yeah, really, I mean, we are restructuring our code, adding new variables. It's simple to forget the critical. Yeah? That means we would have an uh, error again or uh, and so forth. Yeah? So that uh, there should be something that the compiler can do for us. And actually, uh, what we are doing is a very common pattern in parallel programming, and this is called a reduction. So when we have multiple threads, uh, contributing towards the computation of a global or final result. Yeah? But during the course of the computation, we have something like a private um, variable. That means uh, threads have partial, individual partial results. Then uh, the reduction workflow or this reduction clause, sorry, can be applied because uh, we have this workflow where we have a global variable or shared variable, private variable in between, and the result again provided in a shared variable. You know? So the reduction clause takes an operator in the list of variables as an argument. The operator is the plus sign here. That means this is being applied to these yeah, automatically privatized variables at the end of the parallel four in this case. That means a construct to which a reduction clause applies. And we specify the variable, yeah, which is the S, again, which is being applied in the reduction uh, clause. And in OpenMP, we have several uh, reduction operators for the built-in data types and the partial, uh, sorry, the private variables, oops, let me go back, uh, are being initialized with the um, neutral element regarding the uh, respective operation. So for the addition, it's zero. For the multiplication, it's one. Then we have the logical comparison, uh, sorry, the bitwise comparison. In operation, we have the logical comparisons. We have uh, uh, the x, what is the English term, exponential function. We have the minimum initialized with the largest number for the given data type, and the maximum initialized with the least number for the data type. We have the subtraction, but I believe that it doesn't make any sense, and that probably will be um, uh, made obsolete or. Uh, yeah, will be thrown away at some point. Yeah? So I don't believe that makes any sense. We also have user defined reductions, not covered here, but covered a little bit uh, later. So with it, yeah, I would put I would like to put everything together into a final example. I, I hope we are okay in time. I think something like five minutes later than anticipated. And the final example is also a homework that we have provided. Uh, but uh, if you work on the code yourself, try to not look at the slide and just remember what I was saying. Uh, the Pi code has been used, I guess, to illustrate almost all parallel programming models. So we can approximate Pi by computing an approximate solution to this integral from 0 to 1 over this term. So this term is captured here. Yeah? It's 4 divided by 1 plus x meaning the argument to the power of two. And uh, the more integration points we use, uh, the better our approximation gets. So that means here uh, we call that uh, we compute the distance between those 
approximation point or uh, integration points, uh, which is denoted by n, that's the number of integration points. And in parallel, we can evaluate fx yeah? and um, uh, call f with this argument yeah, step by step, uh, um, iterating over the integral, adding it up, multiply, uh, multiplying it um, with a distance, and uh, th thus delivering uh, the approximation. If we do that uh, for an n in the order of millions, uh, this computation will take it some time. But this example produces a wrong result. And this is the first simple example uh, that's uh, by intent uh, on a slide with an uh, error. So let's take a look what's happening here. So we are writing to variable fx with different values of i. Yeah? So potentially for two different threads. Fx, sorry, has been declared to for the parallel region, so it's a shared variable. That means we have to make it private. Private is okay. Yeah? It can be an uninitialized private variable uh, because we are writing to it and then reading it. So it, that means in every iteration, it's being defined before it's uh, being consumed. Fh, it's a constant variable, so we can ignore that. I as a loop index variable is only red, yeah, that's a constant variable. But f sum again is causing us some trouble here. And um, what would happen if we uh, parallelize, uh, if we privatize f sum, yeah, then the computation would be correct throughout the course of the parallel region. But then in here, all the partial results would be gone. So this is again a shared variable. And the consequence, we have to add a reduction, yeah, again, with an addition operator, operator on the variable f sum. That means every thread will receive its own f sum during the course of the computation. And then the global sum will be computed here. So I didn't forget anything. Yeah, OK, here I also said private i, which is optional. So I set the loop index variables um, of loops to which the four or the do construct, uh, work chain construct in Fortran and 4 and C and C++ do apply, uh, are privatized automatically, but it doesn't hurt if we say that um, explicitly here. And I, I believe private fx and reduction were being um, uh, explained. If you try the same out, this code on your own, yeah, uh, just one uh, comment, say reduction f sum, and then uh, play with privatizing fx or not, and asking the compiler to do aggressive optimizations or not. And the solution of the effect, or I mean, the explanation for the effects you might possibly see uh, can be discussed next time. And with that, uh, I hand over to Michael. And do you want to share the screen, Michael, or do you want to say click and I advance? No, I'll 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 take it over again. Okay. Uh, takes one second, and it should be coming up. OK, so I'm not going to steal too much of your time, um, maybe 10 more minutes. Uh, just a quick introduction into OpenMP tasking, um, and potentially an answer why you had to write parallel four uh, to say, I want to parallelize this loop, because we have more to offer in OpenMP, and tasking is one of those additional models. So let's assume that you have something that is not really well structured like the problems that Christian was talking about. Say you have an unbounded loop. So what we didn't specifically explain, but which is covered in you know, the OpenMP reference guide, and of course also the specification, is that we only allow a certain set of for loops or do loops uh, that can actually be parallelized using the work sharing constructs that, uh, that we introduced. Um, and pretty much what the restrictions are is that we have to compute the shape of the loop iteration space up front before we start the parallel loop. And an unbounded loop is where this is not the case. So something like a while loop, right? That you can theoretically parallelize in some cases, but OpenMP doesn't have a real mechanism uh, for this at this point. So you probably want to do something around this. Or you have a recursive problem where you call the same function all over, uh, taking two different paths uh, through your search space, uh, like some of the graph algorithms are recursive formulations. Or, you know, very traditional example is maybe 
um, sorting where you know you basically split up the problem by dividing and conquer into sorting the left half and then sorting the right half and then somehow figuring out how to merge the two halves. So basically, anytime you basically you know have something in like a recursive fashion. Now this all doesn't really well blend well with what uh, Christian was talking about, but OpenMP has a, a notion to parallelize these things. And I'm giving you one example over here on the right hand side, um, where uh, you know I have a traversal of a, a linked list where we don't know upfront where the next element lives in, in memory, and we also don't know how many uh, elements we actually have in the list. And so what we what we do here is we basically start out with a parallel region, and then we have one thread enumerating kind of each and every list element of the linked list. And then for each element, we create what we will call a task in, in, in the future session and for the rest of the day. And then, you know, this task is then responsible to compute whatever uh, you want uh, to compute for each list element. And so while one thread is enumerating the list, all the n minus one other threads can start working on those tasks as they've been created. And I'm trying to show this down here in this picture where you know you have your parallel team, the initial thread is this one, and then we have the n minus one workers. And so anytime someone out of this parallel team steps on a task construct, it basically puts something into a task pool and then available threads will pick up those tasks from the task pool and start executing the code. And what we will show you in the in the next couple of sessions is that we have multiple scenarios. So we have single creator uh, and multiple consumers. So you have one thread enumerating all the tasks and then multiple uh, executors working on those tasks. We can have multiple creators. So any, any thread in the system can pretty much create those tasks. And of course, we can also nest those tasks so you can have tasks that generate more tasks, or you can kind of blend task creation with parallel constructs like work sharing so that you can have a multiple of threads uh, creating those tasks in parallel. Now, what is a task? Um, so a task in OpenMP language is a unit of work whose execution may be deferred or can be executed immediately. So this is something that can run concurrently and then it's the OpenMP compiler and the OpenMP runtime system to decide if you have enough resources to actually do this in parallel. Um, the tasks are usually composed of code to execute and a data environment. And if you are a computer scientist or uh, know a bit about functional programming, this is what a functional programmer would call a closure. So basically a unit of work encapsulating the data that it needs to evaluate the code that it's supposed to execute. And then, you know, it also contains some inter internal control variables, but I don't want to go that far in, in, this, in this part today. Um, and then, you know, tasks are created when you reach a PAL region. So all the individual threads uh, in the block of code that they're executing is called an implicit task in OpenMP. That's some sort of historic speciality, how we bolded the task model into the thread-based model that OpenMP brought since in, in inception. Then obviously, like I was showing before, the task construct is also creating uh, an explicit task. When we encounter a task loop construct, we will talk about that in our next session, um, we create explicit tasks per chunk uh, so that we get a parallel loop execution. And then later, probably after summer, we're gonna talk about GPU programming, and this is also when we encounter a kernel or a target construct in OpenMP syntax that is running on an accelerator. This is also considered a task. And you'll see some beautiful interactions that, are, that become possible by doing this. All right, you've seen those patterns before on, the, on one of the previous slides. So this is a quite common pattern. Um, that you create your n minus one workers plus the initial thread. So that's your n threads in your team. And then you restrict execution to one thread. Uh, so either via the deprecated master construct, via the mask construct, or via Pragma open and P single. And then this uh, one thread will kick off the task parallel execution. And then the task tree basically unfolds 
under that single task or thread doing the execution. All right, that's as much as I wanted to say about tasking at this point. In the slides that you can read offline that are part of the uh, series website, uh, you can see the Fibonacci numbers. Uh, not the right way to do Fibonacci numbers, but again, uh, kind of a Hello World example that nicely fits slides. Uh, so you can look at this. What I want to talk about and close the session with is uh, the hands-on exercises and how to do them. So um, Helen already has set, set, shared the links. So there's a GitHub page under the NERSC uh, organization, open in P-Series-24, uh, where you can download either you know an archive of the source code or you can git clone that. Uh, if you need help, let us know in Slack, and we, we will be more than happy to help you with this. And then once you downloaded this, uh, either way, you can type build, uh, sorry, make, and build everything um, and start playing with it. The way we organize this is each of the exercises has a folder called solution. Um, and that's where we added what we think is a good solution for the problem. Um, and you can either use that to be inspired. My slide says cheat, but that's, uh, you know, be inspired by our solution. Or if you worked on this on your own, uh, then you can check if you came up with the same solution. And the, um, the problems are really open-ended, so you can play as much as you want with it. Uh, usually it's enough to basically add one or two directives in the source code, but you know, they're, these exercises are meant to break them, right? Experiment them, produce race conditions, make an error, uh, because that's when you learn the most out of these out of these examples. All right. And if you need help, like I said, I'll uh, uh, Christian and I will have an have an eye on the chat uh, in Slack, and we try to uh, to do our best uh, to answer in time. Please bear in mind that we are nine hours ahead of uh, Berkeley time or nurse time. Um, and so, you know, responses may be a little delay, have a little delay depending on which time of your day you're answering and, and which time of the day this means for us. Okay, and then, you know, for the overflow for the first session, we have uh, five examples, Hello World, Pi, you've seen those two. We have a Jacobi, uh, we have a work distribution and we have MinMax. Uh, that you can play with. And like I said, you know, just add OpenMP directives to that, break the compiler, break the example, and just have fun with, you know, exploring OpenMP with those with those simple examples and also playing with different strategies, maybe add some performance measurement capabilities there um, to take timings or so, just to see, you know, how the codes behave depending on uh, different numbers of threads, different compiler options, and different uh, open MP directives that you add. And with that, to be continued, in about a month, we're going to have our second session, and uh, Christian and I will be around a little more for questions. But I think it's now back to Helen for some more slides. Okay, I'll go over some um, some more slides, and then uh, we'll have open the floor up for questions. So thank you. So first of all, thank you so much for giving the presentation and also be willing to um, watch out for Slack questions even during the, the whole seven months here. And yeah, as 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 Chris, um, Michael said, they're in Germany time. So be patient. And also have putting a survey uh, link in the in the Zoom. And if you're leaving, um, please do a survey for us. Or you could wait for a few days because there's questions about exercises in the survey link. Um, so now I'm going to talk about uh, using OpenMP compilers on Perlmutter. Um, You could uh, stop sharing, please. Michael. Here, talk about using OpenMP compilers on Perlmutter CPUs today. So this is a Perlmutter system. Um, it's on the bottom, uh, the downstairs of the NERSC building. So we have uh, GPU nodes and CPU nodes, about 1,800 GPU nodes. So for the, these exercises, we'll be using CPU nodes, which have, uh, each of them have two AMD EPIC um, compute nodes. So to access 
and parameter. So nurse users, you can just continue to use your existing account. And every non-user was sent an instruction to how to get a training account under the project and train eight. Unfortunately, we cannot um, just having your uh, training account be persistent during the whole half a year also. So everyone has a account uh, for session one through about for 10 days also. Um, so when you are done with exercises, be sure to capture your contents. Uh, so for your own purposes to review um, to your own machine, or if you haven't finished uh, exercises, you can still do, as long as you have an OpenMP compiler somewhere else, you should be able to do exercises. Um, to log into Parameter, just SSH username parameter.nurse.gov. Uh, nurse users know that you have to use MFA plus your password. For training accounts, you just need your password to log in and don't lose your password because it's the only time one time shown on your screen. And if you lose it, you will have to get another account. To get your homework exercises, we do recommend to use our Scratch file system and then get clone, um, the NERSC GitHub repository, CD, and then go to session one exercises. And you can choose uh, C, CPP subdirectory or Fortran subdirectory and go to an exercise 0, 01, 0, 02, et cetera. And underneath there's also a solution, <laughs> as Michael mentioned. Um, you can simply just do make and, and to compile and then as batch um, the, the uh, example name dot slurm to submit batch script. And I'll talk about a few other ways to do that as well. So on parameter, the GCC compiler is a default compiler. This, we use the module system and you log in, you type module list. This is uh, the default module is being loaded. So it's under program environment, GNU. This is an HPE system, the way of managing uh, the user environment. And once that is loaded, the GCC native uh, version 12.3 is also loaded by default. And normally if you, see you, you have been using GCC, you might use you know, GCC, we call them uh, native compilers, GCC, G++, and G4Chan. Um, on, on parameter, it's recommended to use compiler wrappers, uh, just little CC for, cap, for C codes, capital CC for C++ codes, and FTN for Fortran codes. So the way you use compiler wrappers, it helps you to find all the include files and libraries, um, especially when you later on need to use MPI along with OpenMP, the wrappers take care of all of these things. And it underneath do use the compiler native compilers. And then to compile an OpenMP code, um, just use the wrappers um, and with the at dash F OpenMP flag for uh, the GNU compiler, GCC compiler. But there are also other compilers available on Parameter. The way to, to get to those is to use um, the program environment, other things, program environment NVIDIA, program environment Cray, pro program environment Intel. Then you just load, module load, for example, you load NVIDIA compiler uh, program environment. After you've done that, you do a module list, you will see that um, this is loaded, but then also the NVIDIA compiler now replace the GCC compiler and it was a default version 23.9. Then again, you would use the wrappers to, to build. And you can still use dash F OpenMP flag, uh, but as well, um, the NVIDIA compiler, they, they're more, um, Commonly used flag is called dash MP, but it's dash F open MP also works. And then if you want to use Intel compiler, program environment load uh, dash Intel. And then again, you could use dash F open MP to compile. So like nothing changes. Underneath uh, it uses uh, the Intel compiler and then use actually dash Q open MP uh, as the flag. As um, Michael mentioned, a list of compilers. Um, and on, on Parameter we have Four, and there's also a program environment um, error of VM that doesn't use the wrapper. So I'm not talking about today. Then uh, running jobs on parameter, as I mentioned, we uh, you can use as batch uh, a job script. So here's a sample job script. You will see the job script in the exercises directories. So this is just a, a, a quick um, things you have to ask, you know, how many nodes and to submit to a, what kind of QoS, the different queues there, how long you want it, and dash capital C CPU is that you want a CPU node. And they give it a name, and also you give it output file um, that use the job ID. Then you could set number of threads and then run my code.exe. Um, in the example um, directory, 
these flags are long names. Let's, it says this here is dash dash QoS equals uh, debug. Here is dash dash nodes equals one, but the short name and long name are equivalent. So that's one way to ask batch your job. Another way is you can have an interactive batch session via SALOC. Then you would say SALOC, I want one node. I want to use an interactive queue. I want a CPU node for 30 minutes. After that, wait a short minute, little seconds or so, depends on how busy the system are, up to six minutes of wait. Then uh, you either get a node or you don't. And once you get a node, you're on a compute node, you can compile there, you can you know set your environment variables, you can run um, something, and then you go to a different directory, do something else. So it's like you get your output um, interactively. Instead of a batch job, you wait uh, for the job to run and you check output later. So that two ways you can do uh, your homework with. Um, there is in the um, GitHub directory exercises, there's also a, doc, a PDF file of examples instructions and their ways of how to which each exercise is what are the exercise your your tasks are homework tasks are and how to run um, your compile and run is also um, included in that documentation finally just want to mention quickly on a cpu node as i mentioned is two amd uh, milan node cpus each of them has 64 physical cores so there are 128 physical cores per CPU node. And then each core has two hyperthreads. So meaning we call them 256 logical cores, cores total. This is the batch, Sloan batch scheduler sees it. So it has 256 logical cores that it can use. It can um, create up to a team of up to 256 threads uh, when you um, start a parallel region. If you don't set um, OMP num threads or if you don't set num threads class explicitly, you'll likely see 256 threads running with most of the ex current compilers. So if you don't set up any of those, you compile it with dash F open MP and you run it, say hello world, you'll see 256 lines of hello world. So just let you know, and the all, um, Exercises, the batch scripts, uh, we actually have set them to different numbers, so one, two, up to like 32 or so, 48. So it's like more a uh, controlled set of output you'll see. So with that, this is all my uh, slides. I will turn back to the session for anyone who wants to ask any questions. You can either raise your hand and we'll ask you your name and you can unmute and speak, or you can uh, continue to type uh, a question or two in the Slack channel. Um, Iraq, Yeah, this is just a quick question. So in the in, in the batch script here, you have a loop set up for you know different end threads. So it will be single job, but the entire node will wait for one to finish until it starts another. So, so there you will get be single batch job. You get the allocation of a one node allocated yeah. to your job. Inside alloc inside your node, you run multiple executables, multiple instances. You can run A dot out, you can run B dot out. Right. The way to run is ex number of nodes, A dot out, number of nodes differently, and A dot out. So right. they run so, so the, Right. So the node will execute with N threads one. And then once it's done, the node will execute uh, it, you know, N threads two and so on, right? Yes. They will, okay, they will not interfere, okay. Um, Aza? Oh yes, hi, thank you. Um, I'm just uh, wondering about your last slides when you mentioned about Slurm and hyperthreading. Can you uh, like tell us a bit more why hyperthreading is used in this case? Or why hyperthreading is used? So by default, each node has the hyperthreads enabled and you can choose not to use it or you can choose to use it by the way to do it is you can ask for how many uh, cores or how many threads you ask for. So if you ask for up to 128 logical cores um, to your um, batch job, then you are not using hyper threads. Uh, so I mean, is there, to... yeah, I'm sorry. It's, I mean, is there an, an advantage of using hyper threading for my applications or it really depends? It really depends. You can come try to, especially with MPI uh, being mixed in the picture, you should try uh, to find, uh, we call them sweet spots, how many the MPI tasks and how many open MP threads per task. 
And then you can use choose to use hyperthreads all the way like MPI times open MPX 250 equals 256, then you would be using hyperthreads. Or if not, you can say MPI number of tasks times open MPX threads up to 128, then you're not using hyperthreads. You would compare performance. Mm, okay, you can use time, those things time together less than 128. <laughs> All these All right. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shibbo? I'm sorry if I mispronounced that your name. Hello. Yeah, yeah. hi. Uh, yeah, thanks. Th th thanks for that. Uh, I had a quick question. So uh, if if my app application don't have MPI, is there a performance difference that I can expect uh, when I'm using physical cores versus logical cores? Depends on the memory you need. And um, I think also there's OMP proc bind, uh, you know, close or, or spread. You will, if you close, you have multiple threads, then you'll be using two hyper threads on the same core without actually you want probably want to spread it out using uh, different cores per thread, uh, different threads per physical core to get better memory access. So uh, not, in to, uh, not to having a contact switch when using uh, threads. So like with I I I for most of my DJAM based application I use like block block bind and play places to limit uh like to limit the threat switching. I noticed that uh like o OMP like at the number of threads at one one twenty eight leads to higher per per performance than two fifty six. So. Uh, do you have any idea on why that might be the case? Uh, when you're using less than 128 uh, for MPI times open MP, we uh, suggest to use uh, OMP proc by an equals core and mm -hmm. uh, OMP places equal. Uh, OMP yeah. places equal. And then, and and then if minus you are using 256 MPI tasks. No, how do I say that? Um, you have when you having uh, more than one hundred twenty eight uh, MPI tasks, then you still want to enable OpenMP. Then you have to say OpenMP places equals threads. Okay, okay, makes sense. Um, we yeah. are gonna talk about proc buying all these uh, new stuff um, in session three. So, uh, Michael and and uh, Christine, if you want to add something now. Uh, question already called it a day because it's getting late over here. Yeah, go ahead. No um, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, yeah, hi. You, so yeah. Uh, okay, I was suggesting that uh, is there a performance different that I can expect when I uh, use OpenMP without MPI, uh, like on physical cores versus logical cores. I have my block binds and places as like co cores and true, uh, but I, I was noticing when, when I run like DJAM based applications that there was a performance difference when I uh, did it in uh, like sk scheduled it on physical cores and versus logical cores, like the max. Okay, so I mean, the difference between physical core and logical core is that the second hardware thread that you see in the operating system uh, basically fills in execution gaps in the first hype hardware thread. Um, so that when the first hardware thread has, you know, like an execution gap and it's waiting for something that it can fill in instruction from the second hardware thread on the, of that same core. Um, so it basically means that it, it's not a full extra core. It's just, you know, like whatever the other thread leaves um on the on the table as kind of free resources so you typically don't see a factor of two speed up you see less than that um and because dgem is usually heavily optimized um it also means that the first hardware thread will pretty much consume all of the resources that that core has available um so in that case you basically potentially add more overhead via the additional thread creation time plus the additional synchronization overhead than what you get back from uh, the actual execution. On the other hand, if you have something that is completely memory bandwidth sensitive, 
Um, it also means that the second hardware thread will not provide anything useful because it usually means that the first hardware thread will already consume all of the memory bandwidth that the core has available. Um, and so adding a second thread competing with the first uh, hardware thread uh, for the same resources will not help either. And overhead will basically um, potentially even slow down your code. And then, you know, between those two extremes, like completely compute bound like DCHIM or almost completely compute bound like DCHIM and completely memory bound, there's a whole lot of gray in between. And so, you know, you, you basically, you will have to measure if your code and which phase of your code is actually amenable uh, to make good use of, of um, hardware threading. And it seems like it's a bit of personal opinion um, that uh, in most cases, uh, uh, HPC applications are pretty okay running on only one hardware thread of a core and pretty much leaving the other one for everything else that is running on the node. Like, you know, your SSH connection, your daemons, making sure that MPI runs, uh, those kind of things. So it's not very common that you see a good a, or a reasonable speed up um, for, you know, across all of the HPC applications. Okay, okay, makes sense. Thank you so much.